right. So I think we can go ahead and get started. We don't want to, um, we'll let everybody in as um, they kind of meander in past the hour. So um, we just wanted to let everyone know I got a few additional housekeeping items. We have turned on closed captioning. So if anyone needs that feature, you should choose the notification above the closed caption live transcript in the meeting controls at the bottom of your screen. So that should be there uh, if you need that. And then additionally, uh, we will be keeping an eye on the chat. So please feel free to drop your questions in as they arise during the presentation. We will signal to Dr. Vermund uh, if there are any clarifications, questions that he can address. So these don't have to wait until the end of the presentation. So please keep that in mind. Um, and there will be time after the presentation for discussion and debate. So at this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Kathy Baumgartner, our Associate Dean for Academic and Faculty Affairs and Professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Population Health for the University of Louisville School of Public Health and Information Sciences. Kathy, take a moment and un there we go. We're, we're getting our hang of our unmuting. We got gotcha. you. Wait. Um, Paige, yeah, let me grab are you going to a meter? Yeah, you need to turn yeah. that. So sorry, um, Dr. Baumgartner. Because you're the host, Paige, you're going to just um, unmute her and she'll be fine. Okay, it should be. I'm unmuted now. Okay. There you go. I think it's working. So okay. sorry. The third time is always the best. So <laughs> good afternoon, everyone, and welcome for the to the first of our four part Woodson lecture series. Um, I think uh, that uh, Paige has a slide with the information about our upcoming speakers, which I believe she'll be showing to you in the next few minutes. I know that I'm really looking forward to Dr. Stinverman's uh, presentation today, which is on COVID-19, public health action in a partisan environment. And so I'll just take a few minutes to acknowledge that this series is being funded by the Woodson Lectureship Endowment, which was established by an anonymous donor in 2014. I also want to thank Nana Amaaya Bullock and Daniel Malik and all of the leaders of the school's Student Government Association who were instrumental in pulling together this webinar series as well as inviting our keynote speakers to participate. We're grateful um, to all of the students who were involved, but also especially to Nana and to Daniel for their commitment to student engagement to student networking and to learning. I also want to extend a special thank you to the team in the Office of External Affairs, Melissa Schreck and Paige Wills for pulling this together, taking care of the promotion as well as the registration. So I'm now gonna turn it over to Daniel who is an MPH student in the epidemiology concentration and he will introduce our speaker today, Dr. Sten Vermund. Thank you, Dr. Baumgartner. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stan Vermont, an infectious disease epidemiologist and a pediatrician who serves as the Dean of the Yale School of Public Health. He is a member of the National Academy of Medicine and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences. His work fo focuses on disease in resource limited settings, including HIV, AIDS, parasitic diseases, and sexually transmitted infections such as human papillomavirus. He received his bachelor's from Stanford, followed by a medical degree from Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Shortly after completing his residency, he pursued a doctorate in epidemiology from Columbia University. With such an impressive CV, Dr. Ramon accolades are far too many to name. He has championed the role of contributor in the field of medicine and public health by serving on a number of national advisory committees, acting as a reviewer to over 70 high impact journals, mentoring over 80 doctoral students, leading over $10 million in grants and projects, 
and publishing nearly 480 articles and counting. Dr. Ramon has a special interest in implementation science, which focuses on increasing coverage and quality of services. In 2020, he pivoted his work towards COVID-19 interventions, which led us to our discussion today. Without further ado, I present Dr. Stan Ramon. Thank you, Daniel. Can folks hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. That's great. So uh, it's a great pleasure to join you today. And um, uh, we are going to, uh, and you can see my slides. That's the more important question. Yes, we um, have All a right, screen brilliant. with you and the slide. All right, brilliant. So uh, I have a bit of a provocative title and, uh, and uh, I hope to do it justice, but I'm going to try to finish early so we can have a, qual uh, a question and answer and comment period so that you can have your own say on this vitally important matter. So uh, a little bit of a historic note, uh, a little bit on schools, which are a real flashpoint for the, this issue, and a little bit about clinical disease in children, um, uh, a little bit about COVID, and then um, uh, a little more about students, and we'll get to vaccine hesitancy and communication. So coronaviruses were thought to be an interesting viral class, uh, but it was a relatively minor medical issue for children. There were four coronaviruses that did and currently circulate in, uh, in um, respiratory virus season, otherwise known as flu season, uh, in uh, temperate climates uh, in the North, that would be December to March. And uh, then SARS hit. Uh, in 2003, 2004. And that had a high um, case fatality rate, uh, about 10%. And it had the epicenter in Guangdong province in Southeast China. It quickly went to uh, Hong Kong with a doctor who was attending a medical meeting, then from some of those other people attending the medical meeting to Toronto and other parts of the world. Uh, it kind of died out showing that it's infectiousness, human to human, was very amenable to uh, quarantine and isolation, classic public health measures. And unfortunately, the world kind of forgot about it. Um, then came the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, uh, the, uh, the uh, MERS, and that's been a little more uh, sort of steadily transmitted over the better part of a decade. Uh, and, but it only got out of the Middle East once, and that was with a uh, business traveler from Korea who went back to South Korea, and there was a little outbreak there. Uh, it's far more lethal, more than 30% case fatality rate, but it's not very infectious. So one would like to think that after SARS, we would have thought, well, why don't we develop a vaccine against coronaviruses in case something like this comes up again? And then we can pivot it um, more, more rapidly. And maybe we should think more about treatments. Unfortunately, neither of those two uh, occurred. Uh, but SARS itself was no big surprise. After all, we had the 1918-1919 Spanish influenza. We think that killed 50 million people around the world. Um, we know about a variety of types of zoonotic influenza uh, that come from pigs and birds and other creatures. And we've known about the risk of pandemic diseases. Um, the, the pandemic respiratory viruses have been predicted to um, uh, be a threat for decades. Uh, these two books by journalist Laurie Garrett, uh, The Coming Plague and Betrayal of Trust, are about um, pandemic threats and then um, the deterioration of global public health infrastructures, respectively. And they were written in the early 1990s. Uh, this book by Warren Andaman came out just as COVID was breaking. Um, and uh, these documents from CDC published in 2017 uh, were crystal clear on the risk of pandemic uh, influenza threats and how we could prepare for it. But unfortunately, um, we sometimes feel like uh, the Greek mythical teacher Cassandra who uh, angered the gods and was condemned to be able to speak the truth, but no one could hear her. So she knew the future, but she couldn't convey it to anybody. And sometimes we feel the same way. 
Um, this is a picture from Seattle of some of the public health officers who were dressed uh, almost like police, police, police uh, officers uh, in their effort to uh, control a pandemic spread. Now, keep in mind that this, um, this uh, uh, global pandemic influenza of 1918-1919 was far more lethal than World War I itself, with which it was juxtaposed uh, temporarily. And uh, as I say, an estimated uh, 50 million, it could be a little fewer, uh, many more. And, uh, and you can see that four times the number of Americans died of influenza in this time period than died of World War I. Uh, it was an odd flu because it preferentially killed young adults, which is not typical for influenza, which tends to target the elderly and the very young. Here is uh, just a reminiscence from that era. Uh, there was a little ditty that the uh, little girls uh, composed uh, for their jump roping. I had a little bird and its name was Enza. I opened the window and influenza. Uh, you can see these closed theaters, which are reminiscent of the past year. And then there is a political cartoon saying the way the Germans did it at Chateau Thierry, uh, namely uh, using machine guns to kill North Carolinians. This was a, a North Carolina newspaper. And then the way that North Carolinians do it at home by coughing on people. So there was a real uh, sense at that, in that era of uh, the devastation of this uh, disease. Now look ahead to modern day Kentucky. So I pulled this uh, uh, earlier this month from uh, uh, Lexington Herald leader, quoting the governor that more than 95% of the 443 people under the age of 60 who had died from COVID since early July were unvaccinated. Only 21 out of 444 people had been inoculated. So. Uh, if one were to say that um, mortality from uh, coronavirus is now uh, largely um, uh, uh, occurring in the unvaccinated, that is true all around the country. Every single study that I've seen, every single report that I've seen, the data we have from the Yale New Haven hospital system, which represents five different hospitals in our state, the statewide data from Connecticut, statewide data I've seen from New York, they all say the same thing. So the reality is that uh, we are uh, feeling very keen to overcome some of the uh, partisan rhetoric that, uh, that inhibits people from uh, getting vaccinated. Here's a, here's a picture of some African school children uh, you know, why are uh, schools uh, relevant in this debate, this partisan debate? Well, schools are crowded. Uh, they um, uh, may have varying levels of supervision of the children. They uh, obviously are focused on education of the young, which is one of the main, uh, you know, if you've got a job as a kid, it's to become educated. Um, uh, we have adherence challenges in uh, youth, and we have a lot of mixing in schools. So a whopping 1.4 billion students have stayed home during this COVID period um, in all of the uh, blue and turquoise um, uh, countries, namely virtually every country in the world. Now, serious long-term effects of COVID-19 are rare in children. There's not as much cytokine storm and the disease resembles more of the other four coronaviruses that were recognized before SARS, which cause a a cold symptom uh, syndrome or of mild flu. Uh, on the other hand, there have been um, uh, nearly 5,000 um, cases of multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, the sort of MISC, uh, and 41 related deaths from MISC. Uh, and uh, that's a lot of kids. On the other hand, it's uh, within a large denominator of nearly 6 million children infected. If you look at data from Australia, Switzerland, and the UK, which I've referenced below, you'll see very low rates of mild symptoms uh, in children at three to six months after infection. And they conclude that long COVID is rare in children. Uh, we can even argue as Song did in Network, uh, in JAMA Network Open recently, or uh, near the end of about a year ago, uh, that uh, COVID poses a lower risk of school-aged children compared to seasonal flu. 
So uh, one can make an argument that children should be vaccinated against influenza and they should also be vaccinated against coronavirus. After all, we vaccinate children against polio and um, diphtheria, uh, and we do that to prevent them from getting polio or diphtheria, even though risk is far lower than for COVID or for um, influenza. And I think this is one of the sad realities of the current debate. Uh, folks don't quite appreciate that the whole, the whole basis of vaccine is to prevent uh, lethal diseases, and our, our threshold is fairly low. Uh, why we vaccinate a child, uh, most girls are not gonna get cervical cancer in their lifetime. On the other hand, papillomavirus vaccine is highly advisable. Uh, most children are not going to get uh, any number of those diseases, and yet the, for those who do, uh, the consequences can be lethal or very life, uh, serious. Now, as you all know, uh, the mRNA vaccines are remarkably effective. The so-called breakthrough infections are rare. In the HEROES study of 4,000 healthcare and essential workers, uh, there were 161 infections in the unvaccinated workers compared to three infections in the fully vaccinated folks, and they were about half and half vaccinated at that time. Um, um, the, 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 I made this slide uh, uh, a couple of months ago. No, I didn't make it that long ago, a few weeks ago. And uh, at that time, 56% were fully vaccinated. I think it's up to 58% now. And death rates uh, were in the fully vaccinated were breathtakingly infrequent. By the way, when a vaccinated person does die of COVID, very often they have serious underlying conditions. We had a death in Yale New Haven Hospital the other day. It happened to be a 93 year old with multiple underlying conditions. That person was vaccinated, but uh, it's plausible that they would have been um, at risk of death in any case. Uh, vaccinated individuals are less likely to pass the virus on to unvaccinated individuals, although that's a little less true for Delta. And vaccines protect against infection with all known variants of concern. So we haven't found a variant yet that is circulating widely uh, that the vaccines don't protect against. And I think this makes some sense because the vaccines are targeting the spike protein of the viral coat. And that spike protein is very similar across uh, coronaviruses. And it's essential for the coronavirus to uh, infect a human cell. So if a mutation, a so-called variant mutation were to distort the architecture or the physical integrity of the spike protein, it may also make it impossible to infect us uh, or less robust or less lethal. So, so far so good. I'm not saying that we won't need polyvalent vaccines at a future date, which have vaccines against several variants. It's possible that we might need that in the future, but so far we haven't needed it. And furthermore, if a, if a uh, serious variant does emerge, we have the technology now to very quickly develop that vaccine. So I'm not living in mortal fear of variants, even as I uh, regret uh, the emergence of the Delta variant, which really substantially complicated uh, global disease control uh, measures because it was so much more infectious. And here are a number of uh, uh, references if you take a quick snapshot uh, on, these, on these different issues. That's the beauty of, that's the beauty of uh, online. You can, you can take pictures of whatever you want. <laughs> Now, um, the UK folks would say that vaccinating adults protects unvaccinated children, and they draw that conclusion by uh, the remarkably successful rollout of uh, COVID va vaccine and, and the consequent uh, decline in um, case rates in all age groups. Now, since they didn't vaccinate the kids, they drew the inference that there was some <clears throat> level of a herd immunity phenomenon that seemed to reduce risk for children if you vaccinated enough adults. And in our country, where we don't have such high vaccine rates in uh, many states, um, it may be more critical to vaccinate the children so that we ironically protect some of their un unvaccinated parents. So why do we want to vaccinate children if the, um, if the disease is not quite as uh, lethal or uh, frequent in terms of serious disease. 
Well, it does kill. It does kill. And uh, through end of September, there were um, there were um, well over uh, uh, ne nearly 500 deaths in children. So the reality is that uh, we don't want these children to die of COVID and we would like them to be vaccinated. I already showed you the missed statistics, nearly 5,000 persons with um, with vasculitides, uh, many of them including the heart. So missing days of school, uh, isolation, quarantine are very disruptive. Uh, there's risk to vulnerable children and adults from the unvaccinated child. They may not be particularly vulnerable, but what about that child who's battling cancer or who has diabetes or the grandparent at home who's immunosuppressed? And as I mentioned a moment ago, achieving herd immunity in the face of vaccine hesitancy in adults and preparing for future infectious or pathogenic variants. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if we had maximum coverage because there may be some cross-reacting immunity, even if you don't get as vigorous immunity, you may get some. Now, what have we learned uh, over the past year? Uh, I think that the uh, risk of surfaces has been overstated. Uh, and we may be able to get back to sharing objects in class with a lot, without a lot of concern. Um, the evidence that um, outdoor activities is risky is very slim, and we are um, keen to uh, continue mask use with risk indoors, but outdoors we may be able to forego this. Um, that uh, testing after travel is pretty low yield. Um, that um, if a teacher is vaccinated, they can much more comfortably go from one class to another. Um, and uh, three foot distancing seems to be uh, as good as six foot distancing, judging from a very large study in Massachusetts in which they compared schools that had six foot distancing and their COVID incidence rates to three foot distancing and their COVID incidence rates, and there was no difference. And the reason I believe that uh, sort of natural experiment is because the schools that couldn't manage the three, the six foot distancing tended to be the more urban and less well-resourced schools. And they tended to have parents who were overrepresented in essential worker and blue collar positions, and they were going out to work where, whereas the white collar families, uh, often those, fa those parents were able to work from home. So the bias would have been to show greater transmission in the th three foot distancing. So given the directionality of that bias, the fact that you didn't see increased risk in the three foot uh, is even more convincing. And there are other studies that also suggest the three foot is good enough. And, um, and I already commented on the risk. So um, what are the risks and benefits of current COVID policies at school? Because this has been weaponized by our partisan uh, debates. Um, this is now an excuse to get rid of school boards, uh, the, gov the uh, gubernatorial candidates in, um, in Virginia have faced off now uh, and, and masks for children in school are a central campaign issue. Uh, and we see this in my state of Connecticut, even though we have one of the highest vaccine coverage rates in the country, we still have extremely vigorous anti-vaxxers. I was on a webinar for a state legislator the other day. And afterwards I got the, uh, uh, Connecticut version of hate mail. It's not quite as bad as what I've seen elsewhere, but uh, notes like double check if you're going to buy a house that no Yale faculty member is living on your street because they're crazy. Another another note was don't trust. I don't trust anything I hear from Yale. And a third a third note uh, was this guy is a quack. You know, so <laughs> so, so uh, you know you go into the public sector, you're going to get some heat. Um, uh, the enthusiastic parent groups that are in the, in the um, uh, anti-mask camp. In fact, a giant billboard greets me driving home from work that says, unmask our children. Um, and that's the Connecticut Libertarian Party that has this giant billboard. So uh, no matter where you are, you're getting folks. So what are the harms of ongoing restrictions? Masks, some distancing, trying to minimize classroom density. Yeah, one could argue there's some disruption to learning, especially for children who, for whom English is not their first language and they may have trouble lip reading as a teacher is speaking. Uh, there can be some fear and anxiety, uh, other mental health challenges, 
and unnecessary use of staff resources and time. Uh, I would argue that the fear and anxiety that I've seen has very often been transmitted by the parents, that children are actually quite cooperative and quite eager to help protect each other. And if it's messaged well, students are often enthusiastically participating in safety measures in the school, which is sometimes undermined by what they hear from home. So that's a very uh, tragic circumstance. Now, what are the benefits of ongoing restrictions? We protect unvaccinated and vulnerable members of the community, and we protect children from COVID-19, as I mentioned, even if it's not so serious as in adults, it can be uh, serious in some children. We've written a lot about this. We have a chapter in this book and we have published uh, on our, on, on our uh, website. If you're interested, there's the website. You can just put YSPH COVID and schools and you'll come to it. And there are a lot of school directed initiatives for disease control and a lot of individual level risk reduction measures. Uh, obviously, personal behavior, hand washing, masking, surface disinfection, sort of at an individual level, uh, school directed or are uh, reducing physical contact as we did by restricting sports in the, in the peak period of, of uh, COVID, remote learning as we did uh, last year, a lot of administrative controls and engineering controls by improving ventilation. And uh, we've written a lot about this. This is a, uh, um, an updated version of our um, chapter, if it's of any interest to you, which is, which is uh, open access uh, on the internet. Uh, we've also guided uh, um, schools with minimal resources. We've guided arts organizations, even, even families in their homes uh, with simple uh, low cost air purifiers a $40 box fan, a, a $20 um, MERV 13 equivalent filter. Uh, the, the home filters have a different, different, uh, different uh, categorization, but you can just Google it, the MERV equivalent to this, this filter and buy the right one. And you can attach it to the back of a fan with just wide uh, painter's tape, the blue tape. You don't even have to bother with the putty. And you can, um, do, do it to the back of the fan and have it pointing in the right direction. And you can uh, pull air through this and massively improve your air quality in a room, even in your house. And, you know, for 60 bucks, this does roughly the same thing that a $400 air purify does with a fancy HEPA filter. We are concerned about our mental health of our kids. Uh, and again, I'm wondering how much of these challenges are coming passed on from parents, uh, but uh, we have had increased number of mental health related emergency department visits uh, with youth uh, suicidal ideation, sleep disruption, depression. Um, um, parents have reported worse mental health than their children and worse child behaviors in some of them. School underperformance, obviously, and if you're an underachiever in school to begin with, or you come from a disadvantaged home, closing schools doesn't help. And, um, and uh, protective factors, including exercise, having siblings, predictable routines, and, and, and your family actually actively participating in COVID prevention adherence, all of that reduces a risk of mental health disorders in children. Uh, if you've had a prior mental illness, if you have early life stresses, uh, older children, uh, girls, um, uh, uh, food insecure, insurance insecure, housing insecure, all of that, exacerbates. So um, we are keen to have a balanced approach to things like COVID risk versus school opening. I have actually uh, been keen to help schools stay open and I've spent a lot of time uh, doing precisely that. Now, let me go back in time again. Uh, this cartoon comes from New York City in the 1930s, actually in 1930, when there was a smallpox outbreak. And uh, there's the sea of uh, smallpox, the cliff of misinformation, and the anti-vaccinationists, the fattest, Mr. Careless and, and, and Mr. Anti-Everything are marching over this cliff of misinformation. So there's nothing new about um, the battle for evidence-based public health and the uh, reality that we will have um, 
folks from every walk of life. We'll have celebrities like Jenny McCarthy. We'll have uh, attorneys like Robert Kennedy Jr. We'll have physicians like a guy I saw on CNN the other night who uh, I met Robert Mendelson here. So all of the books on the right side of this slide are anti-vaccine books and they're generically anti-vaccine. They're not anti-COVID vaccine. So we've had uh, an anti-vax movement that has unfortunately grown in size based on uh, political rhetoric and uh, the weaponization of public health for partisan purposes. Um, now, part of the, the, our challenge in public health is obviously to increase vaccine enthusiasm and decrease vaccine hesitancy, because we know something that we hope everyone can learn, which is that there are um, nearly 7 billion vaccines that have been given on uh, the face of the earth at the present time. We've had over um, 240 million Americans get at least one dose, about 190 almost a million Americans get both doses. So we have a vast, vast treasure trove of safety data about these vaccines and they are mind bogglingly safe. And they're unbelievably protective. To get a 95% effective vaccine that is almost universally safe it's like a dream come true for an infectious disease epidemiologist slash pediatrician like myself. That's like the best we can do. And yet we have this rhetoric about the risks of vaccines. Um, so uh, as many of you know, Pew Trust and also uh, Kaiser Family Foundation, uh, we, we have a group called Data Haven in Connecticut that's doing surveys. So a number of survey groups that are asking questions similar to this. If coronavirus vaccines are determined to be safe by scientists and is available free to everyone who wanted it, would you definitely get it, probably get it, probably not get it, or definitely not get it? So these are the data from December through July. And here are the really great news. Last December, we didn't have vaccine, but uh, there are 34% wanted it badly. Um, but in reality, uh, we far exceeded 34%. By July, we had hit um, 67%. And uh, there were still uh, about 8% who were keen to get it. And another 10% who were, wanted to wait and see what the, what the um, data would show from a longer follow-up of these vaccines. But uh, the scary part here is the dark green where uh, it's varied between about 13 to 15% every single month, regardless of the data, regardless of the safety uh, 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 evidence, regardless of the efficacy evidence, regardless of statistics about um, death from COVID being uh, a 95% phenomenon in the um, unvaccinated, we still have the vaccine resistant folks. So um, let's take a look at who those folks are. If you go from the bottom, if you're uninsured under the age of 65, you are the most uh, vaccine hesitant. So this will represent a lot of the, the working poor. They don't have, they have a too, too high an income to qualify for Medicaid, but they have too low an income to be getting insurance from their employers. And um, this is also going to overrepresent uh, rural residents. And you can see rural residents right here at the 21%. Uh, Republicans um, at about 20%. And that, that's a lot of overlap, obviously, with the uninsured in the rural. Uh, the younger you are, the more hesitant you are. Um, there is a, a correlation with uh, evangelical principles. Uh, and some of the, the dynamics, uh, political dynamics in some of our evangelical churches. Um, and then um, ad adults without a college degree, Hispanics, men are less, are more, more resistant, uh, independents, uh, and the total is up here. So you can see that uh, uh, blacks and uh, whites as a general, you know, very broad group are about average. But then the Democrats, the older folks, the college graduates, folks with serious health conditions, urban residents, uh, and women are, 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 are less hesitant. So this, this gives us a little bit of sense of our demographic 
and where our attention is going to have to be placed to, to the greatest degree. And uh, one can see that um, those who are um, believe that uh, coronavirus has been exaggerated as a risk are more likely to be unvaccinated and more likely to definitely not want to be vaccinated. So I have been fairly uh, measured in my own speaking. I've tried very hard not to overstate the, um, the uh, problem of coronavirus because even in the folks over the age of 65, uh, case fatality rates are under 3%. So if, if one looks at uh, the reality is the average person who gets coronavirus is not gonna die from it. But I also point out what these risk subgroups are and how idiosyncratic the virus can be. So an occasional 40 year old without underlying medical problems can die of COVID. And I can't predict who that person is. Yeah, if they're a little overweight, maybe, you know, there are, there are a few, few, few indicators, but, but, um, but they're not particularly strong. And there are many people with my, minor uh, risk factors that can suffer ill uh, simply because their immune systems overreact and the cytokine storm is launched in them. Um, keep in mind that this party affiliation has become quite toxic where uh, the Democrats least hesitant the independents half and half and the Republicans most hesitant. Um, and we even have a chunk of healthcare workers who even though uh, they may have agreed to a, a, a flu vaccine because everybody knows healthcare workers should get flu vaccines to protect their patients, somehow have a different perspective when it comes to COVID. And we can talk about mandates and whether healthcare agencies and hospitals and clinics should mandate uh, their employees to get um, to get uh, vaccinated for the, for the safety of their of their patients and clients, and we can discuss that uh, in a moment. So, um, persons who resent authority are twice as likely to never wear a mask. So, keep in mind that there is this anti-authority, anti-government sentiment in our country. Uh, it's more prevalent among Republicans, it's more prevalent in rural areas, it's more prevalent in Southern and Western states. Uh, and, um, and you can almost map motorcycle helmet laws to some of these states because a lot of these states do not have motorcycle helmet laws because that's the individual liberty of the motorcycle rider and that's not infringing on the liberty of others. Um, that's the argument made. And individuals who believe the truth about coronavirus is being kept from the public so sort of conspiracy theorists are twice as likely to never, never wear a mask. Now there are resources for us. One was cra crafted by the NIH, another was crafted by the CDC. And I would commend these to you because they're very much focused on vaccine communication. And uh, in talking around the country, I find that a lot of people are una unaware of these two resources. So please uh, avail yourself of the so-called the COVID final report from the NIH and the Health Systems Communication Toolkit from the CDC. Now, how do you actually persuade the resistant conspiratorial? I try to affirm and agree as far as I can um, to validate and respect their concerns because it doesn't do me any good to show them that smallpox uh, cartoon and, and call them an idiot. That doesn't get me anywhere as a health educator. So. Um, if, they, if they wax eloquent about pharma and making money, you can say, you're right, the pharmaceutical industry making a lot of money on this. It's a fact. Uh, you're right, the vaccine was developed in record time. You're right that the government has historically treated certain groups like African-Americans horribly or Native Americans or whatever uh, the group is you know, that the, the patient is concerned about. Uh, something like, you've thought about this a lot. Well, I can tell you, you value your freedom. You, you've got to say something a little bit disarming, and then you can try to address some of the misconceptions that folks have. Has this worked for me uh, often? I think it works for me a lot more with the hesitant crowd than it does in the uh, dug-in resistant crowd. Uh, I've also reminded people that President Trump got coronavirus, he then subsequently got fully vaccinated against coronavirus and he very promptly uh, had his entire family 
vaccinated, including his, um, uh, I think, 12-year-old son. So um, sometimes those arguments are helpful. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, we also sometimes can argue, look, you don't want the vaccine for yourself because you, you, you never get the flu. But you should think about your loved ones, your family members, your clan, your club, your, your group of, of, of friends, because you never know if somebody is immunosuppressed and you could inadvertently pass it on to them. Um, and you can say, look, we want to preserve your independence. We want you to, to be able to make decisions. I'm just advising you uh, what I would recommend. And this concept of be a protector, that if people are poo-pooing the vaccine for themselves, can you be a protector for your community? Because a lot of the people who are anti-vax are very pro-family and very keen. Uh, and don't hesitate to recommend some of the celebrities on YouTube. Every once in a while, somebody seeing Dolly Parton getting vaccinated at Vanderbilt University uh, with a big smile on her face and re repurposing one of her old songs to sing about the vaccine, you know, it, it, the charm just knocks your socks off. And, and there will be people who listen to Dolly Parton. There will be people who listen to Morgan Freeman. And, and there are these folks who are spokespersons uh, for it. And, you know, counter arguing is likely counterproductive and information alone may not uh, convert the viewpoint. They may need more of an emotional hook, like be a protector for your loved ones. I'm gonna, I, I meant to finish at quarter two I, I, I just to say that here at Yale School of Public Health, we have a mountain of activity in this space. A lot of our faculty are working on this in different contexts. And um, I'm sure the same is true at the University of Louisville, University of Kentucky, schools of public health, um, and the schools of medicine, schools of nursing, because honestly, we all have to help our health departments at this critical time. And we've had a lot of press in the work that we've done, a lot of dissemination, in non-traditional, non-peer review uh, formats. I myself wrote a, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I took a photo from the, from the screen. It didn't come out very well, but I wrote something in the Connecticut Mirror. Oh my goodness, when was this? July of last year. And I said, is classroom teaching advisable during COVID-19 with precautions? Absolutely. And I highlighted why I thought we could teach safely if we did the right thing in schools. Um, my own graduates, four of them, they had just graduated in May and I just handed them their diplomas. Four of them got very cross with me and wrote, an, a, wrote a counter editorial, is class, classroom teaching advisable during COVID-19? Response, absolutely not. <laughs> so you do take some risk getting out there and you do get called a few names, but at the end of the day, if you can make your, I, I had a lot more positive response to this than negative including from teachers and parents and, and folks across the state who said, this is what we want. We wanna reopen schools, we wanna get life back to normal, but we wanna keep the children safe and we wanna keep their loved ones at home safe and we wanna keep their teachers safe. I'm gonna skip this uh, just to say that there are a lot of ongoing projects that we have at our school in this space. So my last slide, we now have vaccines. The great challenge is communicating with the hesitant and the resistant. Uh, and I wanna thank you most sincerely, particularly to the students for inviting me to give today's Wood, uh, Woodson uh, keynote seminar presentation. And, and uh, I'm gonna look forward to the subsequent ones being given by a bunch of friends of mine. So uh, enjoy this series. And I hope I've left enough time for some uh, commentary and, and uh, question and answer. Dr. Vermin, thank you so much for not just joining us today, but sharing your expertise and your perspective, as well as that um, very interesting historical perspective. Uh, and I really liked your nice, succinct comparison of the old versus the new guidance. I think that uh, that is often at the heart of uh, some of the miscommunication that people uh, cite as their reasons for not wanting to be vaccinated. So Paige is now going to moderate questions and answers that are posed in the chat. And I know that uh, Dr. Vermont is open to debate and discussion. So do please engage. 
I'm gonna kick off the discussion first with a question that was posed by Donna Arnett, Dean of the University of Kentucky uh, College of Public Health, who I know um, you know. She was unable to attend today. However, she did submit a question for you. And she notes, here in Kentucky, the situation is very different in rural versus urban settings. Complexities in health literacy, transportation, et cetera, are big for rural areas. Public health messaging has not always worked and in fact may have been counterproductive. Could you speak to the rural urban divide in the pandemic as you see it and how this may or may not be partisan? Um, yeah, Donna didn't see that slide where I completely agreed with her. The evidence is powerful that uh, rural uh, living and educational, lower educational levels are correlated with vaccine resistance and hesitancy. So there's no question that she's right uh, in, her, uh, in her observation. Now, in work that I've done uh, in rural settings, and I lived south of the Mason-Dixon line in Maryland and, and Alabama and Tennessee for 29 years, and have done a lot of work in rural Africa, it's all about who is trusted in the community. So um, it may be more useful to work with the pastors and work with the um, political leaders and work with uh, the owner of the local hardware store and the owner of the local hairdressing salon or barbershop to try to identify um, opinion leaders in the community, in the rural community, whose voices will be trusted more than the professor at the University of Louisville, University of Kentucky, or Yale University. So the notion of um, securing allies and having folks from the community who become spokespersons can be very um, uh, helpful. We had an experience, uh, I have a small collaboration with the University of Michigan and they were working in a rural setting. And they identified a gentleman who had voted for Donald Trump who was a bodybuilder, who um, had uh, gone, been in the military, uh, had never gone to college, and uh, was a welder for a living. And uh, his wife had an immunosuppressive disease. So this motorcycle riding Republican, you know, rural, not too well-educated veteran, you know, just ticked a lot of boxes of somebody who might be, might be vaccine hesitant, became a principal spokesperson in favor of vaccination and spoke very eloquently about his need to vaccinate to protect his wife and that he was asking all his friends to vaccinate to protect his wife. Those sorts of stories may get you a lot further than all the data in the world. And having it uh, presented by someone with credibility in the local community may get you much more uh, uh, mileage than the dean at Yale you know, University. Uh, so I feel like we need to go back to basics. I mean, our, our health educators could have told you this 20 years ago. These are fundamental principles in the field of health education. We just need to rediscover them and figure out strategies to apply them uh, more effectively. We've been doing a lot of work with our African-American churches here in New Haven and Bridgeport and Hartford. These are three nearby cities that have high African-American populations. And uh, we are seeing the needle shift in terms of, um, of the proportion of folks in, uh, in the urban setting here uh, who are African-Americans. Uh, the numbers who are being vaccinated are going up every single day. Now, I don't have a control group, so I can't prove to you that our engagement of community-based organizations and churches was the factor, but I don't think it hurt. All right. Um, so I am going to go ahead and ask you, we have a few questions that have come in in the chat. Um, one of them we have that was submitted prior, they want to know, do we now live in an alternate realities given that there are medical experts in Congress giving wrong ideas and rebuking basic fundamentals in public health causing long-term collateral damage to fights against other diseases as well as COVID-19? 
Well, it's very disturbing uh, when one sees public health as a political football. Uh, let me, you know, let me not fool anybody. Public health's always been political. I've been in this field for 40 years. It's always been political. If you want a new sewage treatment plant so that you don't discharge human waste into the local waterway because your old sewage treatment plant doesn't work, you're going to have to put a bond out and raise taxes to pay for it. And so you're going to have people who object to that. So, but, but what, what, isn't, what isn't the case is that we had all the Republicans uh, agreeing or opposing something and all the Democrats on the opposite side. That's new. We always had uh, people from each party who understood um, the need for prevention, the need for infrastructure, the need for uh, keeping our water, our air, uh, our children safe. So um, this partisanship is, I'm afraid, very cynical and very disturbing. And I don't think that uh, um, um, we can tolerate it. I think we in public health need to sing the message of bipartisan support for public health measures. We need to alert, we, we need to figure out the language to reach the opinion leaders who currently have drunk that partisan Kool-Aid and remind them that having water that's safe to drink from the tap is not partisan. That treatment of human sewage in a safe and effective way is not partisan. Having clean air to breathe is not partisan. Not having um, you know, toxic dumps not infect our wells is not partisan. And protecting people from dying of COVID is not partisan. So I, I, I know that everybody on this call likely agrees with me. Uh, so it is a matter of trying to reach across the aisle and find like-minded persons who have not uh, been as extreme in their uh, partisan responses. Now, for example, uh, um, the senators, I think Rand Paul may not have gotten vaccinated, but I think all of the others have gotten vaccinated. So, you know, there are plenty of people in Congress who all they have to do is tell, look, tell their constituents, look, I got vaccinated, I would recommend you get vaccinated. I'd love to hear Donald Trump speaking out on that more frequently, because it'll be very helpful when we have more courageous folks uh, who are from rural areas, who are uh, Republicans, who are uh, from African American and uh, Latino communities, uh, who are speaking to their own constituents. Thank you. I have had a um, few come in I know we are getting close on time so I am um, gonna ask just a couple more and then I, I know that you are open to um, providing your contact information if people want to follow up um, so one of the ones we just had come in is from Jordan he said I've heard some physicians urging vaccinations in an almost sneaky way by appealing to the political sense of their patients Republicans are dying because they are unvaxxed and they won't be able to reelect Trump if there aren't enough Republicans in 2024, how do you feel about this type of tactic? Um, I think that we need to try to hold all of our political leaders and all of our policymakers accountable. And that could be a school board, or that could be a congressperson or a senator or a president of the United States or a governor. And I believe that if we take the high ground, avoid inflammatory rhetoric, uh, try to recruit allies who actually may not have voted the way that we might vote, uh, we will have much greater success. So I'm very keen to say yes to any sort of um, popular media request, um, but I'm happiest when that popular media request is not from a media source that I know already agrees with me. I'm much keener to, um, to uh, represent my point of view with folks who don't agree with me. That's why I went on, um, we had a state legislator who asked me to join a webinar for, their, uh, for her constituents and she went out of her way at my request to invite the anti-vax and anti-vaccine folks on that webinar. And I tried to speak to those folks and try to argue some of the points uh, that masks are not forever, 
We are simply um, trying to keep our children safe until uh, rates go down far enough and then we'll get rid of the masks. That one of the best ways to get rid of the masks is to increase vaccination rates and uh, uh, try to counter some of the misinformation around vaccines. Now, how well I did, I don't know, but at least I'm trying. And I think each and every one of us has to do that and try to leave sort of an attitude at the door because you're not trying to convince people who already agree with you. You're trying to convince people who don't agree with you. So you need to sort of use some of the tips that I think I shared a moment ago on the slides to try to break the ice with these folks so they don't immediately label you as some kind of Louisville academic nerd and somebody they don't want to listen to. You, you gotta, gotta sort of give the impression that you can relate to them and you want to talk to them um, and respect their point of view. So that's the best I can do in terms of uh, what I would recommend in terms of dealing with policymakers, vaccine hesitant people, but certainly political, political action to advocate for political leaders who understand COVID and want to do something about it is a no brainer. Great, thank you um, for that. I know we are at time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pass it back over to Kathy to um, kind of conclude our presentation, but I don't know if you have time, Dr. Vermoon, to stick around at the end. Um, if anybody had some questions that were unanswered, we may be able to get to those um, after the hour if uh, we have time. Yes, I, I, I do have a little time, so I'm happy to stay. Great, thank you. Okay, thanks, Paige. Um, so I wanted to thank everyone who joined us this afternoon, uh, and Dr. Vermund especially, but also I'd like to thank our university colleagues, our alumni, our students, and our, as well as our state and local public health officials. I know there's several of them on. Um, before we do conclude though, Dr. Vermund, we do want to provide you with a small token of our appreciation. And I believe, Paige, you have a slide to show. So um, on behalf of the University <laughs> of Louisville School of Public Health and Information Sciences and the Student Government Association, <laughs> we'll be sending you a genuine Louisville slugger. And since Dean Blakely could not be with us today, he's pictured here with his own <laughs> slugger bat. So again, thank you so very much, Dr. Vermont, and we appreciate the rest of you all taking time to be with, here today with us. And we hope to see everyone again on December 1 as we recognize World AIDS Day with the presentation by Dr. Ralph DiClemente, who's professor and chair at the New York University School of Global Public Health. Thanks to all of you again and have a wonderful day.